We're here, on campus, in class, at work. We show up because what we do matters. Some things haven't changed, others have. Education is about change. It's what we do. The discoveries, the innovations, the revolutions, the transformations we've been part of. We don't simply manage change or react to change. We drive change. But change needs a solid foundation. And technology is a fundamental piece of that foundation. With the right technology platform, an entire academic community is connected. Recruiters have richer conversations with prospects. Staff create more personalised and engaging student experiences. Fundraising and alumni teams form stronger relationships and leaders have the insights they need to plan for the future. The schools of tomorrow are being designed and built today, and their capacity for change and innovation is being set now. Together, connected, we can make change and innovation possible. We can transform experiences into lifelong relationships. It's the work we've always done, building the foundation, for the future. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Dewar, and I'm the chair of Universities Australia. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're gathered this afternoon, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Well, it's been a great morning already. Um, and it's been just fantastic seeing so many familiar faces and I think you'll agree that we've already had some pretty insightful and inspiring discussions today. This next session promises more of the same and I'd like on your behalf to extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Professor Mary O'Kane. Welcome, Mary. And Professor O'Kane is, of course, leading the team developing the Australian Universities Accord and I know that many of you will already have met with Mary and her panel. So I'm just going to do a quick intro for Mary and then I'll hand over to, to her to talk about the consultation paper which I think she's releasing today. So Mary is chair of the New South Wales Independent Planning Commission, a company director and executive chairman of O'Kane Associates, a Sydney-based consulting practice specialising in government reviews. She was New South Wales chief scientist and engineer from 2008 to 2018, Vice-Chancellor of the University of Adelaide from 1996 to 2001, and Deputy Vice-Chancellor Research at Adelaide from 1994 to 1996. She served on several boards and committees in the public and private sectors, especially related to innovation, education, energy, engineering, health, Antarctica, ICT, and research. She's currently Chair of the Boards of Aurora Energy Proprietary Limited, and Sydney Health Partners, and is a member of the boards of IEMO Services Limited and the Silver Chain Group. We're very pleased that you could join us today, Mary. It's a very busy time um, for both Mary and for the whole Accord process and the panel working with Mary to develop it. The Ministerial Reference Group met yesterday for the first time, and today we will see the release of the discussion paper that will further guide the process, a very important milestone. No one listening today needs reminding of what a pivotal moment this is for the university sector. It is a unique opportunity to tackle the most extensive reform in higher education in decades. Reform that could well shape our institutions for a very long time into the future and contribute significantly to the continued development of Australia. Because universities are part, a very big part, of the engine room that drives this country. Our, our institutions educate the skilled workers that spur the economy, making it $185 billion larger than it otherwise would be. And they undertake most of the research and development that propels the Australian economy forward. But history tells us that these big moments of reform in higher education don't come around very often, approximately once every 20 or 30 years. Um, 
And as a former Vice-Chancellor, Mary, I know I'm, I'm not telling you anything you don't already know. But that's what makes the opportunity that's in front of us so significant. So, Mary, I'd now like to invite you to say a few words and to launch the consultation paper so that we can go to a few questions. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Colleagues, it's wonderful to be here. And in speaking, I, I too would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land and to pay my respects to elders past and present. This is an important day for the Accord Review Panel as we're putting out our first paper. And that's my first task. The Minister told me what I was doing here. I'm launching the discussion paper, so consider it launched. Um, I can give John a signed copy or something if we need to be <laughs> symbolic about it. We've posed for the photo, so we've done that, that bit. Um, it's a great honour to be doing this review with a fantastic panel, and I'm uh, thrilled to be joined by Fiona Nash today from the panel. Various others have had to go to other things, but um, there's two of us here, and so Fiona will answer the questions, I'll give the talk. Um, it's very interesting to be back in higher ed. I've been away for over 20 years, and as you heard from the little John reading out the bio, I've certainly been doing things very much around the universities, but you know, haven't been, it hasn't been my core focus for a long time. And so in being asked to do the review, uh, it, it, I've had to sort of tumble right back into the whole business. And the first thing that struck me was just how impressive universities are. And I wanted to just quickly reflect on that, why, you know, it's just struck me really hard just how good they are and what they do for our country and what they do for the students in them, let alone others who benefit too, staff um, and everyone associated, stakeholders. But some of the things that really imp have impressed me, first of all, the size. To be educating about 1.6 million people a year and to have about half a million of those be foreign students that's pretty good. It's up from um, 700,000 when I left the sector in about 2001. The fact that now we're in a position where um, almost 45% of 19 to 30, 25 to 31 year olds have a degree is pretty good. We're not at the top of the OECD list, but we're up high. And that's one of the questions we ask you in the um, discussion paper is where we should actually get to, but it's still it's good. The quality of our education is rated very well by various measures. Something that maybe is not whether it's good or bad, but it's interesting that our universities are some of the, that we have among our universities some of the largest universities in the world. One of the things that strikes me and impresses me as someone who's done a lot of work on innovation since I left the university sector is how innovative and resourceful and entrepreneurial the universities are. Um, building campuses, acquiring campuses, generating revenue from a variety of sources, using the, the money they make on those things for very interesting things, for example, putting money into capital structures, putting money into research. It's very impressive indeed. Also, universities have become even more entrenched in their communities, particularly the regional and rural universities. They've become a vital part of those economies. And as those economies refire up with renewable energy builds and critical minerals, um, with mines for critical minerals, um, the universities become newly important. But in, you would have heard in that bio that one of the things I do is a lot of reviews. So a couple of the reviews in recent years have been uh, co-leading the New South Wales Fire Inquiry than the New South Wales Flood Inquiry. Um, we're waiting for what comes next. I didn't do the pandemic. Uh, is that it's, it was so startling how important the universities were in helping the communities come back from those disasters. And I think particularly of Southern Cross University in the floods, where it became the, the epicentre of the, the reconstruction and the recovery effort. And, you know, it was, you'd, you'd go to Southern Cross and there'd be policemen tumbling out and firemen. Yeah, for a, quite a while, it was a bit hard to see a student. It's interesting to see how funding is still a central issue in universities and still a challenge, just a different form of challenge. It's also interesting to see how important HECS became 
that hex is something of an international phenomenon and uh, one of the things that Australia is, is really known for. It's great to see how equity and access has improved, but we've got a long way to go. You would expect me to talk about research since it's something I've been very involved in uh, for a very long time. And our universities are stunning. Our universities do uh, account for 36% of Australia's expenditure on R&D. They do most of the work, the underlying work in research, producing the PhDs, the, workforce, the research workforce of the future, um, producing the bulk of the publications, doing the bulk of the basic and strategic basic research, and being wonderful collaborators. We're better collaborators in terms of percentage of co-authors on scientific publications in the US, the UK, and many other countries. Australian researchers are incredible problem solvers, something that I don't think the system gets credit for. And I'd talk, for example, about people like Brett Turner at the University of Newcastle, when I was in my role as Chief Scientist and Engineer of New South Wales, trying to solve the PFAS problem, the, the stuff that comes, that's in the firefighting foam, how are we going to get it off the Williamtown Air Base? And we asked the University of Newcastle, and Brett came forward with a suggestion that we use hemp to bind with the PFAS and take it out of the water at, at Williamtown, something the state then invested a lot in the intellectual property to support the university. Or in bushfires to work with Jason Sharples from here in Canberra, at UNSW Canberra. Jason is the world leader in extreme bushfires and is sort of in constant call, whether it be Portugal, Canada, or sadly, here at home. And what is particularly impressive about those two great researchers is they're both First Nations researchers who have had gigantic impact that's very useful to their, to their country and their regional areas. So, the system's pretty good. And I've been saying that out to industry and to business and things, and I think it's, a, it's, it's underdone. The appreciation of how good it is is very badly underdone. And that's something we'll be saying in the review. This is a good system. And so why are we having a review? I've been asked to talk on that a bit. Now, first of all, the system isn't perfect. You wouldn't expect it to be, and I, I think none of us think it is. I mean, some things haven't moved since I left it. For example, funding is still a real problem. Recognition of prior learning is still hardly where it needs to be. Our links to the vocational education and training sector are certainly not wonderful. Industry often complains that it can't link to university research, that you know, it's, it's not practical or things. There, I could give many lectures on this topic, but I won't. In things like innovation, if you measure it on the Global Innovation Index or the World Economic Forum Index in the same area, Australia is very weak in terms of its results against its OECD peers. We are very good at innovation inputs. We have a good rule of law, we have a good business system, we have very good education at all levels, but we don't translate it into good innovation outputs, to good widgets and services that are globally traded and so on. So there is something going wrong. We might be educating people well, but we're maybe not educating them for what is needed. And that's what the accord is particularly about. It has a set of terms of reference, and I might move on through a couple of slides for a couple of things I want to say. So first of all, just going maybe go, going back a minute and talking about the, the fact that the universities are good. The, Accord Review is a unique opportunity to capture those great abilities and achievements I spoke about, to do something about some of the things that are not so great, and then to reimagine the sector for the future over long horizons. And the Minister has particularly instructed us to go, you know, all the way 10, 20, 30. It's 30, 35 years approximately from the start of the Dawkins Review and the reforms that went with that. Um, this review will sort of come out in that area. So, what are we particularly looking at? We've got seven big terms of reference. It's a very, very broad review and pretty much covers the whole waterfront. So there's a term of reference on skills, one on access and equity, one on investment and affordability, then governance, accountability, community, connection between vet and higher ed, quality and sustainability, and then the one that's cutely called delivering new knowledge, innovation and capability, standing for research, but, but, importantly linking it to that issue I raised about 
innovation. The way the panel has reimagined, to use that term, reimagined the terms of reference, though, is that we have three, if you like, national needs terms of reference, three ones that we must deliver on over time, and that is the knowledge and skills. What are the knowledge and skills of the future? There are some scary uh, estimates of what we do need to produce in terms of the number of people getting a bachelor degree. We're certainly not where we need to be at the moment. We're trying to work out where we should be, and I do ask all the labour economists in the room to please get ready and sharpen pencils to tell us what the answer is. Um, but we do know it's a big jump. So that is one of the most um, challenging terms of reference. And I'll, I'll unpack it a little, bit, a little bit later. Access and opportunity. I already referred to the great work that was done under Denise Bradley's review about getting access and opportunity up and getting a real improvement in underrepresented groups getting to universities and getting through it. And I want to call out the wonderful work that's been done in, across the universities in actually really helping with that issue. But we need to get it at least to population parity issues. And then the issue about delivering knowledge, innovation and capability in getting the research issues right that I've already referred to. So those three big national needs that we must deliver on. Then we have, if you like, four enabling terms of reference, ones that need to be dealt with to deliver on those first three. So that's the investment affordability, the governance one, the connection to, between vet and higher ed, and quality and sustainability. So that's how we're looking at our task. The discussion paper, my colleagues got it down off the rather long version I, I and the the team, the wonderful team from the Department of Education supporting us had first drafted. It's down to just 30, just over 30 pages. And you've got 49 questions in the homework. Don't feel obliged to do every question. A good answer to quest just one question is more than enough. Um, the paper is structured in three big areas. One, talking about the role of higher education and talking about it within the context of Australia's likely futures. And that probably should be plural. Imagining it as different scenarios is important. Then we examine some of the big challenges and opportunities for Australia, the things that will face us and the things that will give us, as I said, chances to move and change. And then we look at the challenges and opportunities for the higher ed sector in the context of looking at the challenges and opportunities and, if you like, responsibilities for Australia. And then it's largely according to the terms of reference, although one thing that people have pointed out to us, and thank you, to all who um, responded on the first lot of consultation on the terms of reference, was pointed out that there wasn't a lot on learning and teaching per se, and so we've actually put a strong emphasis on that as well. And that's the start off of the discussion paper. I want to just talk a little bit about the complexity, not about all of them. I just want to use one example, and that's the skills case. I was just saying that the topics that we've been thrown, it looks broad, but it's also very deep. So when you start to, and I'm not going to go through all of this, just sort of touch on it, when you look at the skills matter, you know, you get to the point, well, if, there's, if you're going to ask for a lot more in the, you know, pe people coming through with bachelors and higher degrees, um, what are the actual targets you're going to set? What are they for certain times? That's pretty hard to actually do that estimate, which is why I asked for the economist to step up. How do you calculate it? Do we want, is it, can we, is it certain disciplines that we want or is it generalists of some sort? Do we want them at ordinary bachelor degree, diploma level, um, postgraduate coursework, higher degree? Who sets those targets? Very importantly, who's going to pay for the system? So we need, you know, Bruce Chapman to redo the magic of HEX and to work out who's going to pay for this one in some way because if we're going to spend a lot more, educating a lot more people, the money has to come from somewhere. Employers are telling us very loudly, and it's a strong refrain, that we need a lot more in the generic skills. Learning to learn, um, being able to write reports, the digital skills, and so on. And we're not just this time hearing it's just about having people who have some knowledge of the generic skills or some proficiency. We're hearing they want that at a very deep level. They want people who are very skilled at learning and relearning, 
very good at writing reports, writing pithy reports that make a, a really good point. So it's how do we possibly increase our performance in generic skills? What do we do when there's no student demand? Can we do rapid upskilling of mature age students? What, you know, where's, what's the role of micro-credentials? What are the various pathways we can get? The equity and access issue is very important in its own right, but it's very necessary to get it right if we're going to deal with the skills issue. What do we do about that link to VET? And then a very big one that's come up for us is the work integrated learning, the link between learning with, when you're with an employer, learning on the job. And possibly the biggest issue raised with us in the review to date has been placement. How do people get experience on the job that's mandatory to meet the professional requirements of certain degrees? And that's a big and very complex issue. Many of you also know the tangles, and I know them well from being on the other side as well. Professional accreditation, should people be paid? Since most students are working, wouldn't it be great if they could be working in the areas of their degree? And then we come to the question of, with all of this, how might an accord on this topic work? And one of the big questions we get asked is, what's an accord? And um, my thanks to my colleague Jenny Macklin on the review panel, and very famous in her own right, um, for one day after we'd been endlessly say, you know, looking at what's an accord, saying this, accords bring people together to discuss challenges and agree a joint path forward. Lovely definition. But it, she emphasised that it is a continuous and a dynamic process. You don't just come together once in an accord. You come together to keep coming together and to be tackling hard problems. And that as the needs change and the parameters change, you're changing what you deliver and you're changing how people communicate about these topics in an accord. And this is what I think is the sort of magic of this particular review is that we're asked not just to hand over a report, but we're asked to hand over a, a report plus a process of how these conversations will go on on the five, 10, you know, 20, 30 years beyond this. So I'll wrap up with just a couple of process comments. So far, we've gone through a... Um, Quite a lot, of, a lot of you have seen us turn up at things and talk, and thank you for all, all the help. Thank you for those who did submit on the first round of consultation. We got 185 submissions and almost 2,000 survey responses. Um, and we've had quite a lot of meetings of various sort, and we're going to continue to have them. Many people have asked me what did the surveys and the, um, the submissions say. Well, it was pretty general, but it was very important. One thing that comes through both on the survey and on the submissions, above all, people want an opportunity for all. It's clear that the hunger for sort of access and equity issues is very, very big in the system and in the stakeholders of the systems. Students told us they want on-the-job experiences, that work integrated learning, that good placement, etc. They want to rethink of the contributions that they make through student fees. Not surprisingly, those doing PhDs and the postdocs particularly said, could we have a good look at the stipends? And those of, us, or those of you working in higher education raised funding in all its forms, whether it's learning, teaching, research, community, infrastructure, or whatever. The submissions said very similar things. Um, improving access, making sure that equity cohorts successfully complete, as well as actually just get access. There was a lot of response on the skills needs and what's needed there. Funding came up again. This time we heard a lot more about the regulatory and legislative arrangements of universities, and there were not so nice comments about job-ready graduates. From here, where do we go? The discussion paper is now launched. You can start writing straight away. You can hand the answer in as I walk out or you've got till the 11th of April to put a submission in to us. As I said, 49 questions, answer whichever ones you want. Don't answer any at all. Tell us what we got right, tell us what we got wrong. Write to us, talk to us. We will be consulting out there um, very much in a very intense period through to mid-May. We're handing in a report Seems to be a lot of homework in this review. We're handing in a report at the end of June, which is an interim report, where we probably, we don't, we haven't worked out exactly what form it will take, though we've worked out a lot of it. 
but we will be particularly putting things on the table, trying them out. Is this how you should characterise the system? Is this one of the ways forward? Are there options here? And then we'll ask you to respond, to tell us, did we get that right? Are there better ways of doing things? Should we conceptualise things differently? And in the period July to November, as well as hearing from you, more consultation, we'll be very testing the ideas we've been putting forward because this is a very bright sector and it's very good at getting unintended consequences from government systems it doesn't like. So we really want to make sure we've tested things. We'll be doing a lot of wargaming and we'll be looking to you to help us wargame, break the ideas as well as build them up and then handing to government a final report in December, which, as I said, will be a report of what we've found and what we're recommending, and that will be also recommending how the, how the government should go forward with the opposition, as the Minister often says, this is a bipartisan approach with industry, with all the various stakeholders, the communities, both here and internationally, our international student communities and our, their, their stakeholders, how we all go forward to implement this over the years. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much, Mary. Now, I've got a couple of questions for you, and then we'll throw it open to the audience. Right. So the first question is, what does a good submission look like? I think it's one that really... Um, it's thoughtful, obviously, but it, but it really takes apart an issue and, and gives it a sort of considerable weight with lots of data, lots of argument as to why the proposal should be as it is or what's wrong with things. But we really want data we, and we want big ideas. I think I forgot the last slide. <laughs> this has got the answer to it. Uh, okay. Think, think bold, be brave. That was, um, that was important. So that's, that's what we want in, in terms of submissions, that people do think very boldly and put ideas to us that, you know, you can actually put in an anonymous submission if you're really worried. But I do really appreciate people who have contacted me with some really amazing ideas. But it'd be great if we can get those on the table. But as I said, lots of evidence, lots of data, lots of good reasoning. Yeah. And this is why dealing with this sector is wonderful. I mean, it's, you know, the, these are people who can think and do, who do have ideas. This is ideas of what this we're about. So mm. if we can't reform our own system, what can we do? Yeah, yeah. Um, please submit questions through the app if you have any, and I'll put them to Mary. Um, second question from me before we go yeah. to the audience. Um, what would you like the legacy of the O'Kane Review to be in 10, 20, 30 years' time? It's a good question. There are a few O'Kane Reviews now, too. <laughs> There's a few <laughs> reconstruction authorities and things to do with fire. Um, it, it's very much... I mean, the. The right answer is to say, of course, they accept all our recommendations and implement them and things like that. But for me, it's actually finishing the work that Denise so ably started, and it's the access issue. I think mm. if we could get to parity points for underrepresented groups, getting through university and thriving with all the things that good things that university have, I'd be very happy indeed. Mm. Great. Good. Now, we've got some questions coming Good. through. Mary, right. get a bit of a oh, heads up mm, as to what I'm they are. I'm older than I was when I left the centre um, too. <laughs> so there, there's an upvote process going on here. Um, so I'm going to take the, to, yes, from we'll Francesca. How will you ensure that the accord is a continuous and dynamic process? What does that look like in practice? Ah, that's up to the minister. <laughs> um, right. What does it look like in practice, is a, though, is a... Is a I mean, it's a good question overall, but in practice, I think it means that there's great commitment from the stakeholders to continue the conversation and very great commitment from the government of the day and all the political parties that this is an important conversation. So that probably means that there's got to be a lot of talking it up and saying it is important and contributing to it. So, you know, articles about it, good submissions to whoever is running the tertiary education system at the time, keeping the other governments of Australia up to it so they keep the Commonwealth to it as well, and on from there. And that is, it raises a very interesting point, how you make reform go beyond one or two terms of government. Mm. And that's one of the things that the Minister has been very clear with us, that we need to find ways that 
everyone will want to sign up and that it will last. Mm. Now you I'm can ask him about that tonight. <laughs> Why don't you ask the same question tonight? That's good. I don't know whether you can answer this one, but this comes from Anonymous. Um, what's the biggest, boldest idea you've received so far? Actually, I can't tell you because the person's asked me not to say. <laughs> um, there's been a few bit of that where I've got to find ways to introduce it and, and come out, but it's, it's fairly, fairly bold. There are, some, there are some very good ideas about uh, whether, the, you know, if we do have to grow the system a lot, what form of universities should they be? Should they spin off existing universities? Should they be creations de novo? Where should they be? Should they be online and things like that? There's been uh, some fairly creative ideas in that area. Um, one thing I'm particularly looking for is very uh, good creative ideas on the learning and teaching space, and I started to find that the other night, meeting with the Deputy Vice-Chancellor's academic executive, where I really heard some very innovative ideas about how learning and teaching will change over time. And we need a lot on that to, to underpin almost all the terms of reference. Nice question from Stephen Naylor here. Is there any appetite to differentiate the university sector? Did yeah. we lose something when we all became universities? Well, of course, the uni we, we are dealing with the higher education sector, as I'm mm. often being reminded when I use the word university. Um, and that there are a lot of private providers in it. So there is diversity, but yes, within the spirit of uh, the question, um, yes, there is there's a, a great appetite to think. And to first of all, think what diversity means. Mm -hmm. In some ways, we are very, or most universities are rather like each other. But in some others, they're very, very different. And I think discussing in places like UA and discussing what we would want in diversity and what its advantages are is something that I would find very valuable. Because instinctively, I think a diverse system is a, is a good one. I asked myself, I've asked John this, I mean, his university is really great in allied health. Why wouldn't you then just move it to become the world's best in, say, nursing or in allied health? You know, it might be very, you know, strongly, emphasis, strongly emphasising one particular discipline. Um, might it be the, sh the where a university is and the form of its teaching? No, but I want to hear about it. Mm. Another question from Luke, Luke Shee, is mission important in terms of defining and understanding diversity yeah. in our sector, sort of related to the it, answers it is. you've just given? And it's become a, a bigger part of our conversations in the panel and our discussions with others. Um, as we've got round, I'm beginning to think mission is very important. And again, would appreciate your views. Going back to the Bradley Review, yeah. question here from Darlene McLennan. The Bradley Review recommended increases in funding for equity groups and increase in funding yeah. for people with disability didn't materialise. How can we avoid this happening again? We haven't completely got the answer how can we avoid it happening again because I don't actually write the cheque. But we will be trying very much to make sure it that it's there. What I think will really guarantee this is a minister who's very, very committed to it. And I think that's the drive to get it really started. I think our job is to make sure we put very good proposals on the table, so we need all the help we can get on estimating what is the cost mm. and what is the best way of doing this. So examples of best practice, examples of stuff that doesn't work would be really appreciated. Mm. Good question here, how, where to contribute? Is there a website? Yes, there's a website. Best thing is to just Google Universities Accord Review or something like that, you land on the website and that, that will tell you where to put in the submission. Um, but you can read you know, lots of things about it and, that's, and I, I write a, an updating letter every so often on it. There's, I think, one going up today. Uh, no. Uh, Do, does the Accord the Terms of Reference include a review of the redirection of student fees to research? There have been a number of yeah. questions that have kind of appeared and then disappeared about... That's the opposition and things disappeared, yes. We'll come back to the opposition. The opposition. Yeah. Um, we haven't been asked to look at that per se, but we obviously look at it because we obviously look at all the funding pieces of things. And this is one of the... Uh, thank you for putting the question there. It reminds me of something I forgot to say. One of the things that struck me most coming into this review is just how much money universities put into research. 
it's very impressive. Mm. The universities get a bit over six billion, maybe six one, six two billion from various schemes and so on, and they put almost exactly the same mm. in from general university funds. Mm. That's a real that's real dedication. And Australia is one of the highest countries in in terms of its herd, its higher education expenditure on research and development. And that is because of the universities being very, very research focused. Um, yes, a lot of it probably does come originally from the student fees. Is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And that's something that would be good to get opinions on. Mm. Um, so I'll go back to that question about the opposition. Has the opposition engaged constructively with your review? Um, we yet to sort of talk around any politicians beyond our own minister in detail. That is coming up in the next phase. But of course, the panel is structured. My colleague Fiona Nash, the Honourable Fiona Nash, who was a minister in a previous government, is part of the panel and is the conduit through to the opposition. And I don't know, Fiona, if you wanted to make a comment about it. But, um, but you know, we have every indication we've got bipartisan support. Mm. Can't see through the lines. Maybe, maybe later. Mm. Um, interesting question here about foreign universities. Any, any prospect of enabling them to enter the sector at greater scale and grow capacity? It would be very interesting to hear your views on it. Mm. Very okay. interesting. And very interesting to talk about how <laughs> our students might be educated overseas more. Mm. How might Australians go? I mean, there's a, a great book out by Professor Mats Benner, who is the leading Swedish higher education researcher. And he points out that you know, the dominant research universities in the world will be, the, will be in Asia in a very mm. short space of time. How will we, how will we interact with them? Mm. Will PA, people be doing PhDs at those universities? You know, mm. What's the link? Question about international students. Where do they fit into the review? And I should have spoken more about it. They're a very important part mm. of, the, of the terms of reference. They're, they're in there in, within one of the sets of terms of reference. And it's this is a, a, an important point too. It's become such an important part of the sector. I, I suppose I should have you know, emphasised that more when I was saying what was different as I came back was how many international students there are and how successful Australia has been at creating that market. But more than the market, it's actually the influence they have on Australia, on our society, on the economy. We always used to celebrate the Colombo plan, but now we have loads more students educated in Australia. And that you know, has, can have wonderful effects for us over time. And we will be emphasising it in the review. But if there's things that are wrong with it, you should tell us. So Justin Bocor has posted a really interesting question. If the sector is to get bigger, maybe 50 to 100 percent bigger yeah. over the next 20 to 30 years, yeah. does that mean more universities or more higher education providers, or does it mean the existing ones just get bigger? You tell us. <laughs> That's the point. That's what this is about. I'm right. um, very interested to hear the answer on that. Should it be all of the above? Hmm. Should it be location? Should the ba they be actually located out of Australia? You know, should one of them be in Papua New Guinea or somewhere? Yeah. And should they be mixes of existing ones cutting away, coming together? There's a lot of things. This is where you can drive a lot of innovation. You know, structure can drive innovation. Um, another question about this, this time about research. Sorry, yeah. we're, we're jumping around a bit. Yeah. But, um, this is from Anonymous. Um, thanks, Anonymous, for all your questions. Um, what role do you think research commercialisation and the relationship between universities and industry, including IP, play in the future. So where, where does well, that come? Okay. You get the lecture now. Um, <laughs> I've never been a great believer in the linear nature of research commercialisation that we, I mean, I spent a lot of time inventing things in my research years and, you know, turning them into widgets to go on and things. I, I, no university in the world has ever made a fortune out of that. I mean, some have done well, but I think the issue is much more about pull through that I think if industry, I mean, why doesn't industry just look at the capacity that's in Australian universities and the expertise that's in Australian university research? And I think the question does come much more through problem solving, through industry getting better at solving problems. 
I find university researchers are superb at spelling out problems. You give them an area, they spell it out and turn it into a problem. Often a, a hard applied problem has a nub of really basic research in the middle of it. I think we need to help industry get and, and, get, and government get better at asking us how to, how to solve things. And I think that will lead to commercialisation as people say, why don't we do things together and, and do things? So I think there's a bright future, but then we, lots of us have been saying that for a long time. But can we try and crack it this time? I'm looking forward to reading what you tell me. Um, the question about regulators. Yes. Um, is Texa them. involved in, you love them, is yeah. Texa involved in the review? Peter's in the audience. Peter's in the audience. Of course, audience, it is. Yeah. Of course it's in, involved in the review. Yes, yeah. we're definitely talking to talking to Texa, and that was something else I should have mentioned that had changed. Of course, there was a regulator. There wasn't a regulator when yeah. I left, and it does seem to have been a good thing. That yeah. I mean, I, yes, yes, yes. I've heard um, people saying how things could be better, but in terms of the assurance of quality out on the international market, it's really good. Just like, however painful era was. It's great to have been able to sort of get the data from ERA to say how good the research is. And so we need something like that. I think we've got time for a couple more, but you mentioned war gaming as yeah. a part of the phase of your process. Yeah. Can you just say a bit more about what that means? Some examples? Really testing ideas, but also testing them from a hostile perspective. What if this was introduced? How could people turn it into an unintended arrangement or how could they misuse it in some way that it led to a place we didn't want to be in. Mm. I think that's what I mean in a fairly yeah. loose, loose term. We're, no, we're not going to sit there doing simulation and with things. Though the minister does call us Avengers, so I haven't worked Avengers. out how we go. Yeah, he calls the panel, <laughs> here come the Avengers. Yeah. <laughs> Which one are you? Ah, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Might want to think about that. Um, right, I think last question, yeah. Mary, and then we'll have to finish. Um, Will data and insights from Jobs and Skills Australia feed into the review? Yes. And if so, are there priorities for the insights the panel will be seeking? And that comes from Simon Barry. Yeah, definitely. We've actually had a formal briefing from Jobs and Skills Australia. Peter Dawkins is on the ministerial reference group and we'll be talking to them and we'll be talking to the relevant government department a lot. And as I said, really do ask for, really need a lot of help in estimating that, that, you know, what, what we need to know in those areas. Brilliant. Mary, um, thank you so much thank you. for your willingness to respond to these questions and for launching the consultation paper at the UA conference. I feel like I've been present at a historic moment. So I hope so. Thank, thank you, you all. Please Looking thank forward to it. Mary O'Kane.